Good morning. <coughs> morning. Today we celebrate Mother's Day. And um, I just Googled how it started. In 1908, there's this lady called Anna Jarvis, and she campaigned for a national observance of this day in honor of her mother, who had organized uh, clubs that addressed child rearing and public health issues. So in 1914, this became the national uh, holiday for the US. Okay, to honor mothers and to be held on the second Sunday of uh, May, which is what we're observing today. So when we think of great mothers from the Bible, who comes to mind? I think about uh, Joshebet, the birth mother of Moses, when she trusted in God and placed his faith even as, uh, into the hands of God as she floated him down the Nile River. Rebecca, the mother of Esau and Jacob. And even though she used the wrong method, and, and she and uh, her husband both played favorites with the sons, she was sensitive to God's choice, and she worked towards fulfilling uh, that. And then we have Rachel and Leah, both sisters who tirelessly gave birth to many children that fulfilled God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of many descendants. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, she was mocked by her, her adversary. She prayed and finally had a son, Samuel, and she dedicated Samuel to a lifetime of service to God. And then, of course, we've got Mary, the mother of Jesus, who despite the fear and shame of this old man, she allowed herself to become God's vessel. But we don't have to go very far, do we? Because we have our mothers amongst us. I mean, who are these mothers amongst us? No, they are heroes. When both the husband and wife are sick, who is the one who will still get up and accompany the child or children to the doctor, send them for tuition or other activities? Naturally, it's the mother, no? Who is the one, despite being busy and tired, will labor over and plan and go and tap out if she cannot even cook, you know, for the kids? Again, it's the mother. Who is the one who is prepared to have her schedule disrupted? Not the father. Father, very busy one. Got all the meetings to attend, you know, and even the mother, though working, will also be prepared to have that schedule disrupted for the smallest of things, like going to the mall with the children. And who is the one who is prepared to lower her pride? Sometimes I don't want to speak to my children because, you know, uh, we don't see eye to eye on certain things, but it's the mother who is prepared to lower her pride and still talk to the children. The list goes on. Come, let's flash that uh, nice, that's, that's the only slide you get, the one and only slide you get for today. This is a Mother's Day comic uh, that's been uh, circulating. I received it about two weeks ago. <clears throat> you know, when the mother takes a break, you really have to hire a lot of fill-ins. Uh. She plays the role of the chauffeur, the, the chef, the nurse, uh, even the uh, minister, right? And if you can see hidden behind, she plays the role of the clown as well for the sake of the children. Now, I'm not saying here that the men don't do anything. I'm just saying that there's a lot that our mothers, our wives do that we don't give them enough credit for. Somebody uh, texted back in my CG this morning saying, yeah, the mother's job is underrated. And it is funny, you know, how this message has fallen on my shoulders. I'm not the model husband or the model parent. I think Pastor Daniel has got a good sense of humor for slotting me in for this. Perhaps he wants me to reflect, appreciate my mother, appreciate my wife. <clears throat> so this morning, I'm not going to dish out advice, but we will look at Proverbs chapter 31 to see what it says about mothers. <clears throat> so we're not sure who composed the book, uh, this uh, uh, Proverbs 31. It is attributed to a King Lamiel. And, and the interesting thing is this, there is no record in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Chronicles, or even in the traditions whom uh, King Lamuel is. 
So there are some people who say he's probably a pagan king who put his trust in God. And through the fear of the Lord, he learned wisdom. But the one thing we know for sure is that God preserved this particular proverb for our instruction, and we should do well to heed it. <clears throat> okay, so now open your Bibles, please. We're not having any slides. Open your Bibles uh, to Proverbs chapter 31. I will be reading from NIV. Um, so if you can turn to that version, it would be good, but you can keep up to ESV or any of your preferred version. Now, even as you look <clears throat> at your electronic Bible or your physical Bibles, you will see that this passage is divided into two very distinct divisions. Um, the first division seems to be the mother's advice against wanton living. The mother's advice as to how to be a good king. And that runs from verses 1 to 9. And division 2, a mother's description of whom a noble wife is, or how a noble wife looks like. And that will run from 10 to 31. So, <clears throat> insofar as it consists of advice on who is a noble wife, okay, man, now remember this, huh? it is a list compiled by a mother for her son. And that's a good mother, you know, who also knows what it means to be a good wife. And, and it seems to me that King Lemuel's mother is of the view that the role of a good mother is all rolled up with the role of a good wife. And within the context of marriage, you cannot divorce this role. You cannot decouple this role. And that's why I've named today's topic as it is, the mother of noble character. The mother of noble character. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you cleanse my lips, you prepare our hearts, and let what I speak be edifying to my sisters and brothers here and be glorifying to your name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, so let's go into the first section, which is the mother's advice against Wenton leaving. And I'm going to ask all of us to read the text together. Okay, we'll read from verses 1 to 9. Okay, the saying of King Lamuel. Come, let's read together. An inspired utterance his mother taught him. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son. The answer to my prayers. Do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Let beer be for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Okay, so keep your thumb on the page. <clears throat> so here is an impassioned call of a mother to her son. Listen, my son, the son of my womb, the son of my prayers, and like Hannah, it sounds like King Lemuel's mother had been praying for God to bless her with a son. And it is on this son that she has placed all her hopes. And her advice is for her son not to spend all his strength on women. It was common for kings to surround themselves with a harem of concubines. You know how many uh, uh, wives and concubines King Solomon had? 700 wives, mostly foreigners, and 300 concubines. You see them once every day, right? You take uh, three years, huh? Take three years. And those familiar here, those who've been watching, you know, whether you've been watching uh, Chinese drama or Korean dramas, I think you'll be able to picture the court intrigues played out, right? By the concubines and by the eunuchs. And, and how certain dynasties, they just go into decline because the kings just busy themselves with eating, drinking, 
and the satisfaction of their sexual desires, the romancing of all their different concubines. And therefore, they ended up ignoring matters of the state and allowed themselves to be manipulated by the eunuchs who were probably working closely with the concubines or who were controlled, who were controlling the concubines. So I, I see some young adults here and just wondering, how does this apply to me? I'm, I'm not a king, right? But I think applied to non-kings, I suppose our young men and our young women here could take heed not to give in to excessive sexual interests or having an unhealthy obsession with romance or sex. The practice of sexual immorality and obsession gives away a man and a woman's strength. And that strength of theirs, the spiritual well-being, the self-respect, the self-control and standing will be given away. So the next advice, I'm gonna, not going to go into the advice in great detail, but I think we should know some of these advice that's being given. Huh? And the next advice is for the king not to drink wine nor crave for beer. And this idea is repeated for emphasis, as you can see there. It says, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed, what has been made into law, what they've said previously, and deprive the oppressed of their rights, because beer is for the perishing and wine for the anguish. You know, people who are in the condemned cell, they're given beer and wine before they're executed. It's for them to dull their senses and remember their sorrows no more. And so in the ancient world, I went to check, the Carthaginians, they prohibited their judges from drinking wine. The Persians only allowed their king to be drunk one day a year. And the Athenians put to death any prince that was drunk and I think the principle here is to ensure that the king's judgment and good sense is not impaired. That would prevent them from fulfilling their duties as king. And the last advice that we see here is for the king to speak up for the weak, the oppressed and destitute to defend the rights of the poor and needy, all of which does not require further explanation. So all these are sound advice for a king. And how is it relevant to the mothers and the fathers here, right? Because <clears throat> I don't think we've got children here who are going to be future kings or rulers. Maybe future judges, maybe uh, uh, future ministers, God willing. But I believe there's a universal principle that we can apply here. King Lemuel's mother's advice was so that if her son listens to her, he would be able to fulfill his God-given role as a king. And she saw his role as God-given. She wanted him to be a good king. And this morning, I believe that from this first uh, uh, section of the uh, passage, the principle for our application is this. The noble mother leads her children to live in God's plan. The noble mother leads her children to live in God's plan. Okay, so this is in the bulletin. Huh? Noble mother leads her children to live in God's plan. It's not clear how our kids will grow up, what they will do. Most of the time, there's no clarity what they want to do, right? When they, even before they enter the university. And sometimes there's still no clarity even as they graduate. But what is clear to me is this, and that is God has plans for each one of our children. The main plan is clear, and that is for each of our children to know God personally. And then he will call them to the different stations in life, um, whatever profession, whatever kind of work, and even call them into full-time service, so that wherever they are, they can impact lives where they work and live. And this is the part that we won't know with certainty at this juncture. <clears throat> So, and I put it to you, it is important for mothers and it is important for fathers to crave, to crave for our children to live within God's plan. And we should strive to give them advice that will enable them to live in God's plans and we will expand our energy, our material resources to put them on that track 
And most importantly, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for them. Here are some questions for us to reflect on. How do your aspirations and prayers, your aspirations and prayers for your children, how do they align with God's plan? Or do they align more with your own plans, your own expectations, or that of the world's view or success? You know, are you aligned with God's world view? Or are you so influenced by the world's view that all you want is material success for your children? So the question again, how do your aspirations and your prayers for your children align with God's plan? The second question I want you to reflect on is, does what you teach align with what you're doing in your own life? Does what you teach your children, you know, particularly when you express your desire for your child to live in God's plan, you say, yeah, you must come to church, you must know God, but does it really align with what you're doing? And, and this is something I've learned a long time ago, even as I was criticized. Say it's easy to teach, you know. You can tell your children what you want them to do, but they see what you do. Easy to teach, but difficult to live out what we teach. And children, uh, even the children, the, the, the primary school children, maybe even the pre-primary school children, they are very discerning, you know. And they are our harshest critic. You tell them to do one thing, they will tell you, ah, but you know, you're not doing it. And here you are telling us to do this. So, insofar as the principle is concerned that we should lead our children to live in God's plan, the best thing and the most important thing for each one of us, mothers, fathers, is that we need to ourselves be living out God's plan. We need to ourselves be seeking to live in God's plan. Okay, let's go into the second passage, very long passage. Um, and this is the uh, second part of the passage, and this is where we see the mother's description of a noble wife, verses 10 to 31. Shall we do it, read it together again? Come. <clears throat> a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a few and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamb does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. And when it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat amongst the elders of the land. She makes linen and garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And honour for her all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. I'm glad I'm not a woman. This is a long list. It's a difficult list. But even as uh, 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 we read through this list, I'm sure for the husbands, you can identify that this, this is what your wives have been doing. Some of you can identify that this is what your mothers have been doing. And if the husbands don't identify the wives here, I'm sure you can identify with a lot of the things here. 
But I think it's a long list and it's tough. So before the husbands start looking at their wives, you know, and then start making comparison and say, hey, look, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Please remember, this is not the wish list of the husband. You cannot, you shouldn't be using this against your wife because this passage gives a goal for Christian women to show the kind of character that they should have as they fear and love the Lord. And it's a double-edged sword because for the young men who are yet to marry, and even for those who are married for many, many years, this passage only reminds us that we must also walk in the fear and wisdom of God to be worthy and be compatible with a woman of noble character. Let's come back to the list. I thought I should just do some highlights here. <clears throat> Verses 11 to 12, it says that the husband has full confidence in the wife. It is not an unfounded confidence, but one founded on the constancy of the wife who seeks to bring good to the husband and family all the days of her life. Therefore, the husband can confide in the wife all his secrets, all his fears, knowing that it would not be used against him. And knowing that it would, and, and instead that he would receive good counsel from the wife and continue to receive the respect and love of his wife. And then the noble wife is very industrious because in verses 13, 19, and 24, she selects wool and flax and works eagerly on a spindle. She makes clothes for herself and her family. And in verse 15, she gets up in the still of the night. She provides food for her family and sets aside portions for her female helpers, for her female servants. Verses 16 and 18, she makes wise investments, buys, and, uh, buys a field and plants a vineyard, and she trades profitably. That last part about the vineyard is what I would like to uh, have. And the husband has every reason to be proud of the wife, right? Because in verse 20, this wife, she opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. She is not only generous, but she extends warmth and care to the needy. Verse 21, she clothes her entire household so that it won't be cold in the winter. 22, she decorates her bed and she puts on fine linen in purple. And I thought I should highlight this. Huh? This shows that this wife, she bothers, number one, to make her husband feel comfortable coming home, you know, with a nice bed that's been decorated. And she dresses presentably for her husband and for the world at large. And therefore, this husband, he is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat amongst the elders of the land. Verse 22. And this is because... The woman at home, she is clothed with strength and dignity. Verse 25. Verse 26. She speaks with wisdom. Her very being brings respect and honour to her husband. So I just remember this Chinese saying, you know. <clears throat> Let me try and say it. Uh. Uh, Candy, don't laugh at me. Xiu shen, ping jia, zi guo. Ping Tian Xia. Pastor is lost. <laughs> it means that a man must first control his temperament, govern his family before he can rule the country and before he can conquer the world. So when family members, and in particular the wife of a leader, misbehave in public or is seen abusing her position, you know, like the wife of a deposed politician in a neighboring country. I don't have to mention her name. Um, one can no longer find respect for that leader. And in fact, the feeling is one of disdain for the leader. So, when the, so the conduct of a woman has great effect on the effectiveness of her husband as a leader. So what do you think is the most important feature or character trait? that King Lemuel's mother has listed so far. What do you think is the most character trait to you? 
What do you think is the most important character trait to God? Let's look at verse 30. Let's look at verse 30. Charm is de deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. The call here is to look be beyond the charm because charm is only but a personality trait that can be used to mask the true character of a person, right? It is therefore deceptive. Neither should one focus on beauty because it is fleeting. It is sad but true. You know, you could have the most beautiful wife, you could have the most handsome husband, but all of us will grow old. I know my friends are at 50 plus, they are now talking about getting uh, six packs of muscles, uh, but you know, we all go saggy and the muscles will become non-existent at the end of the day, unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. Lah. So the call here is to look to the one who fears the Lord. And that is the beauty that lasts. That is the beauty that survives the ravages of time and the fickleness of our human nature. And, and I, I must say that as I become a little bit more mature every year, I begin to uh, appreciate the fear of the Lord in my wife. So the question here is, how does a woman who fears the Lord look like? I think they look like a lot of you here. Lah. But I, I, I believe that she needs to look both like Martha and Mary. Huh? The two ladies in the New Testament, right? Like Martha, she is concerned about God's people and she labors tirelessly to serve them. And we have many Marthas in Moriah. They serve as ushers, singers, musicians, PA, LCD, live streaming, helping out in the fellowship tea, teaching in junior worship, SBC, etc., etc. And they also need the woman of noble character, the wife of noble character must also look like a Mary, who is concerned with and attentively, attentively hearing what God has to say to her. Many of you come to Mora not only for worship service, but you also attend our Sunday Bible class because you crave the Word of God. And, and some of you, you even attend Bible study outside church, like the precept classes or, or Bible study fellowship. And I believe that none can be a mother of noble character without wanting to first seek God and being fed on His goodness. It's, it's like driving a car from here to Jurong West with $10 of petrol in the tank. You can reach the destination barely, but you can't get back. You can't make multiple trips. But going to God on a daily basis in prayer, quiet time, fellowshipping with others, is like having an unfettered access to the patrol station. And that will enable you to drive all the way up to KL and back and maybe make multiple trips on a regular basis. So when you taste the goodness of God, you will desire the same for your family, your husband and your children, and you will receive strength to interact with them and to continue serving them with strength and wisdom that you receive from God. And the principle I take from this second uh, division is that the noble mother desires God for herself and family. The noble mother desires God for herself and family. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Mothers first. How do your daily engagements reflect your desire for God? What you do on a daily basis? Quite apart from what you do for the family, but sometimes, you know, you, you have to draw yourself away from the, the business of doing all these things for your family and find time for God. Your daily engagements will reflect your desire for God. And what clutter in your life prevents you from cultivating a deeper relationship with God? And will you ask God to help you to declutter your life or your lifestyle? So, okay, let's sum up. Who is this woman of noble character? Who is this mother of noble character? 
Well, we learned, number one, that the woman, uh, the noble mother leads her children to live in God's plan, and the noble mother desires God for herself and family. And I think, and I said it, and I'm going to say it again, that within the context of marriage, the role of a mother and that of a wife cannot be decoupled. You know, don't kid yourself into thinking that you could be a good mother or a good father without being, uh, without being a good spouse, without caring for and seeking for the good of your husband or your wife. And I believe that we can only receive, okay, first to the mothers, I believe that you mothers can only receive the strength and wisdom to be a good mother and to be a good wife if you have a personal relationship with God. Same for the men. And so if you perceive any deficiency in your role or marriage, perhaps it's time to look upwards and ask if you've been putting God first. You know, I've been doing a BSF maybe 18 years. And the one thing I noticed, Bible Study Fellowship, huh? the, and the one thing I noticed about the men who join uh, a BSF is that there's this huge percentage of men who join uh, because the wives are nagging them. Go and join a Bible study. Go and join a Bible study. So in the end, the men have no choice but to join. And a lot of these men, they are from corporate backgrounds uh, and they have to do a lot of entertainment. And slowly but surely, and I say this not only of myself, I say this of my personal friends who joined BS, uh, the Bible study, you know, they are slowly but surely being transformed to desire God first. And I'm sure many of them also saw improvement, not only in their family life, but also in their ability to be better parents and husbands. So kudos to the wives and mothers of noble character who pray for and lead their husbands to a closer walk with God. Okay, but remember, it starts with the women desiring and actually having a close walk with God in the first place. So my call this morning uh, to, to the ladies here, to the ladies here, whether married or unmarried, uh, uh, please have your own close walk with God first. And to the children and men, the question to you is, how can you help your mother or your wife to be the mother of noble character? What will you do this year to show your appreciation for your mother or your wife? Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, you are filled with infinite wisdom and infinite love for us. Thank you for our tireless and selfless mothers and wives of noble character. Will you continue to bless them with your overflowing love and strength and enable them to be the noble mother and wife to their respective families. And grant the men here Grant the children here the strength to appreciate them, to appreciate our mothers and wives in Moriah, and enable all of us, each one of us, to crave your presence and desire to live in your plans. Because we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.